بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد رب القلوب ودوائها ونور الصائر وضيائها وعلى أهل بيسه الطيبين الطاهرين المحصومين الصادقين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المسمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صلوات Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to need a much louder salawat than this to give me some energy as well. You know? So give me a very loud salawat. <laughs> brothers and sisters in Islam, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure for me to come to this university. The last time I came here was, I think, a couple of years back. University mainly made up, I think it's Cambridge and Oxford Rejects, isn't it? No one's joking. A sly one there on the Imperial Brothers. I was at UCL, so another Cambridge Oxford Rejects place as well. But as I said, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to bless you, that you have many events and continue to propagate the message of Ahlul Bayt all around the university circuit. If you look around legal systems around the world today, you will find that freedom of speech is of the utmost importance in every legal system. And you will find that the legal system caters and tries to provide boundaries for freedom of speech with certain laws which are put forward in that legal system where mankind understands just how much he can speak. Although within those laws there are many vague areas. For example, if you look at the British legal system, there is a deep entrenched thinking especially about the concept of the freedom of speech. You will find there is the concept of blasphemy. There is the concept of liable, for example, that you are not allowed to accuse public figures as an example of things which they have not committed, or you will find many racial discrimination laws there as well. These are all provided with the recognition that mankind has the ability and has the gift of being able to express himself. You will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in the Quran provides us with certain verses to prove how mankind has that gift of expression. You will find, for example, in Surah Al-Balad, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُ عَيْنَيْنِ وَلِسَانًا we provided him for, with two eyes and the tongue and the lips and then we gave him the two clear parts. Which shows that before any hidayah, before any hidayah takes place, mankind uses his senses 
especially those senses where he is able to talk in order that he recognizes what guidance is available. You'll find also in Surah Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when saying, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ عَلَّمَهُ bayan. He has taught mankind expression, the ability to express his opinions. So you find around the world today, every legal system recognizes that the human being has the ability to express their feelings up to a certain extent. This was of course rocked in 1989 by a certain book called The Satanic Verses, which I'm sure many of you would have heard about, and those of you who are around my age, around the age of 23, 24, that was like, you know, you, you're coming to that important time where you hear suddenly Ayatollah Khomeini has given a fatwa about a man who has written a blasphemous book, a blasphemous book in our opinion, but way to look at what Rushdi says, when Rushdi wrote the book and the fatwa was against him, anyone who's read the book, I don't know how many people here have read the book, the satanic verses, you've read, yes? Satanic verses, what Rushdi does, Rushdi loves to bring myth, and he loves to bring what is the fantasy, and mix it together with reality, and coming forward to a conclusion, and he's won the Whitbread Prize um, on an occasion, especially I think it was for the satanic verses that he won the Whitbread Prize, and he wins it, but when he comes out after the festival, he makes a very important statement. He says, you over there in Iran, your Ayatollah over there saying that there should be a fatwa against before speaking out. But the point here is that freedom of expression should be also the freedom to offend. He says, within freedom of expression, I should be able to offend. Because you're telling me that everyone's allowed to express themselves, so why shouldn't anyone be allowed to offend? I want to offend where, what Muhammad is doing. I want to think of the concept that Muhammad and his wives are indulging in fantasies with other human beings, and that is my opinion. And you will find here that he rocked the whole boat of freedom of expression, but he opened the door for people to come and write what are called academic books, but are bringing the offensive within the academic. So you will find after him, I don't know if you've heard of David Irving. David Irving is the one who denied the Holocaust, mid-90s. He wrote books denying the Holocaust. Before you know it, every Goldberg, Goldman, Goldstein of everything came together and said that Irving's book can never be written and can never be allowed to be published. And Irving, a big campaign went against him that he was never a ever uh, able to express his opinions ever again about the Holocaust. And in the British legal system, a law was nearly passed. It wasn't actually passed. It was nearly passed that no one was allowed to deny the Holocaust. And you find that when Islam is attacked, everyone jumps on the bandwagon, that's, look, there's no problem, it's freedom of speech. When the Holocaust is attacked, how dare you attack the Holocaust? And you find here that the importance of us analyzing this concept of freedom of expression is vital. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawat Allah wa salamu alayhi, used to say, an orphan is not one without a mother or father. An orphan is one without literature. Because it is vital that we don't fall into the trap where the Qur'an states in Surah Al-Jum'ah about uh, how those who came before us مثل الذين حملوا التورات ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحملوا أتفارا What does this mean? This means that you have the, the people who came before us when the Torah was given to them they used the Torah like the donkey The donkey, when it carries luggage, doesn't know what it's carrying No, the donkey just travels from point A to point Z In the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the Muslim world don't just keep, use the Qur'an, just put it on your back and move forward. Don't just let dust settle on the Qur'an or just bring it, bring it out in weddings or funerals or when a famous speaker is coming to your house, bring it out and pretend you've been reading it. No, on the contrary, make sure you actually use this book that we have and make sure you are aware of all the other literature that is being written. I talk about literature here, why? Because recently, a whole host of books are being written attacking certain areas in Islam which are thought of as being as academic books. So when you put it in water stones or in borders, people say, this is an academic book. But within the academic, the poison is there. The offensive is within the, within the academic, but many of us have not come to read them. Here is one example. Why I am not a Muslim. That's a classic title. You know, you're going to get a few readers for that one. Why I am not a Muslim. By someone who looks like he's been a bit scared, understand, he to write his name, someone called Ibn Warra, yes? Um, and he's written this book, Why I'm Not a Muslim, trying to show that everything in the religion of Islam was just um, a hoax and it was all copied from the previous religion. And he's devoted a whole section to what? Woman and Islam. A whole section, a whole chapter devoted to woman and Islam on how the religion of Islam oppresses the woman, on how the religion of Islam does not allow the woman to move forward, on how the religion of Islam keeps the woman in a cage, that a modest Muslim woman can never be modern. 
and a modern Muslim woman can never have any modesty. And therefore he comes forward saying that whoever is modest can never be modern with the times. And whoever is modern can never have that attribute of being modest. And he says Islam does not allow you, does not allow the woman to have many characteristics. Either you are the boring, in his eyes, the boring hijabi woman who just sits at home all day, has no class whatsoever, has no education whatsoever, or you're the modern hair flicking out of the hijab, moving around, playing about with the other people, and so you're that type of person. So he gives you two opinions. And what he says is that there is no way a female in Islam can reach any position of success. Islam does not cater for the female. And then came out a book called The Trouble with Islam. Okay, now of course, when it's put on Waterstone Bookshelf, which is an academic journal, yes, or um, unbelievable from someone who's a famous professor, she's not a professor, but uh, what she's written down at the front of her book, the trouble with Islam, a wake-up call for honesty and change. MashaAllah, that's what, that's what's well written. And then the New York Times, of course, that's really going to be helping us, says, think of Menji as a nerve ending for the West. Shocking, raw, but mercifully, joyously still alive. That, does, that is just saying rubbish, but I don't know which other words to put for it. So here, the New York Times praises it, and before you know it, Irshad Manji, actually Irshad Manji, I'm, I'm going to tell you about Irshad Manji originally was, a, she comes from the Shia community, okay? She comes from the Shia community, she used to go to the madras of the, of the Shia communities. I've recited at the place in Toronto where she used to actually attend when she was a, um, a young uh, child, and what happens is, when she used to go to school, she would ask questions such as, why does it say this in the Qur'an? Unfortunately, some of our teachers when we go to the madrasa when we're young, when you ask, why does it say this? Shut up. Or yeah. you're, straight, you're given a slap straight away. I'm just asking a question. All I want to know is learn. Why does the Qur'an say this? Slap. Why does the Qur'an? Slap. And before you know it, this girl suddenly, she loses all her sense of the religion of Islam and leaves Islam completely and begins to write this book, The Trouble with Islam. Now, I've read The Trouble with Islam. Those of you who've read The Trouble with Islam will know. That is, yeah, it's all over the place. If, if it was something good, I would have honestly praised it. No bias whatsoever, I would have praised it. But it's, you know, it's just absurd nonsense. Some of the arguments are, you know, I, I just don't know how she brought all those arguments together. But she was given a slot on every radio station, every television program. Oprah Winfrey, who Ammar Nakhshawani has to wait nine months before she's interviewed, you see, he gets, she gets a slot straight away, yes? So you have here that anyone who seems offensive towards the religion of Islam is given a slot straight away. But it's vital for the Muslim world to wake up from their sleep in which they are today and actually read the literature, analyze the literature, see what's going on out there, reply to the literature. The ink of the scholar is greater than the blood of the martyr. We need more pens to reply. And on this area, I'd like to analyze this in today's lecture. This area of the role of woman in Islam and whether a Muslim woman who is modest can appear modern in the times. If we speak of modernity, of course, modernity is the most relative term anyone could ever give a lecture to come and lecture at Imperial. Okay, but if we were going to use modernity, modernity, let's just say, is the movement and progression in the affluent society of reaching the best that the human being can reach. I went through Google and that's the best I can find as a definition. Okay, so here, let's just look at this and analyze it. First, when someone attacks the role of woman in Islam, you reply to them from two angles. The first angle you reply is by saying that the only religion that places heaven under the feet of a female is Islam. Look all around the world, and you know, sometimes I remember giving a lecture on Mother's Day, uh, and when I had given this lecture, I said, look, today on every radio station, television station, you've got Mother's Day, Devon and 20% off, you've got this saying this, you know, you've got Mother's Day with a deep analysis on television. I thought, why isn't one of us, if we had people in the media, actually come out and explain the role of the mother in Islam? Napoleon Bonaparte once said, give me good mothers, I will give you a strong nation. And Islam, what happens is that when you analyze Islam, you find the position the mother is given is higher than virtually every other position in Islam. When I was at UCL, I remember one module that I had done was child developmental psychology. Those of you who have done psychology would have heard the names, for example, of Bowlby, Ainsworth, Vygotsky, Piaget, yes, in child de de uh, developmental psychology. Now, two of the most famous ones was Ainsworth and you had Bowlby. Ainsworth had what was uh, known as her strange situation. The strange situation is when a mother goes into a room with a child and depending on the reaction of the child when the mother leaves the room shows the attachment between the mother and the child. Now, Bowlby had a theory of attachments and he based it, what Bowlby used to do, his first experiment was 
that he would analyze mothers who have taken their kids to hospital. Their kids, for example, have just had an accident. The mother has taken the child to the hospital. He said he was analyzing there are two types of mothers. There is the one, the typical Iraqi mother, who will stay with her child the whole night. Yes, there is no way she's going to move from the uh, hospital bed. And then you've got the second type of mother, which is the one who will say at about 1 o'clock, I've got to go home now. Bowlby, on the basis of these two, he said that the mother who stayed with her child throughout the whole night was the one who, was, who had a secure attachment to her child when the child grew up. And the mother who left the child and went home had an insecure attachment. So much in the West comes about this theory between the mother and the child. But one interesting area in psychology was the area that the upbringing of the child begins in the womb of the mother. There is a story in psychology about, you know, uh, neighbors. You know neighbors, the Australian, uh, Australian sort of neighbors, everybody needs good neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> well, not as I watch you, but I've heard about them, yes? Neighbors, okay, there was a lady, her, her child wouldn't stop crying. Her child would just not stop crying. The lady goes to the doctor, she goes, my child would not stop crying. How am I going to sort this out? The doctor says, you know, there's many remedies, trying to give him toys. No, no, it's not working. Okay, the doctor says, while you were pregnant with your child, can you please tell me, what's your favorite television program? This lady's thinking, you know, what, what shall I say that won't embarrass me? And she said, neighbors. And then he said, okay, what I want you to do is, whenever your child cries, play the theme tune of neighbors. And just see what happens. Mother goes home, child begins to cry, mother plays neighbors. Suddenly the, the child remains quiet. And then the child starts crying again, mother, eventually the mother had to play neighbors for about six hours in the day. But when she went back to the doctor, she asked the doctor, Why, how did you find this cure? And the doctor said, psychology has shown that the upbringing of the child begins from the womb of the mother. Islam looked at this 1,400 years ago. In Ziyarat Warit, what do we say? Ashhadu about Imam al Hussein. We say, Ashhadu annaka kunta nuran fil aslab al shanaka wal arham al mutahar. We swear that you were nur, you were light in, the, in, the, in, in your uh, history and that you were pure light in the womb of your mother. Because Fatima al Zahra used to speak with Imam Hassan and Imam al Hussein while they were in her womb. So when people would come and say, Fatima, who are you speaking to? There's no one there. She would reply, I am speaking to my son Hassan, or I am speaking to Hussein. They said, what are they learning? She said, from the womb of the mother, the child's upbringing begins. So here you see the importance of the mother in Islam, and you even turn it around that the only religion which stresses on obedience to the mother is the religion of Islam. You find Imam Sajjad, Imam Zayn al-Abideen, in the, in the Psalms of Ahl al-Bayt, the Sahih al Sajjadiyah. He says, Ya Allah, make my obedience to my mother sweeter than water for the thirsty. Make my obedience to my mother sweeter than sleep for the drowsy. Imagine this line that Imam Zayn al-Abideen has come out with. And you see that the Prophet of Allah, on numerous occasions, would stress on the importance of the obedience of the mother. But there is one narration which is given that Rasulullah is asked to come to a youth. This youth is on his deathbed. Rasulullah is asked, please come and speak to this youth in his final moments. Rasulullah comes, he says, you know, now it's your final moments. You should say, La ilaha illallah, so Allah will look after you. He's trying to say, La ilaha illallah, the youth. But the words, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but God, do not come out. Rasulullah asks again, the words don't come out. At this moment, Rasulullah turns around in the room. He sees a lady there. He looks at this lady, he says to her, can I ask you a question? Are you his mother? She said, yes. He said, how many years haven't you spoken with each other? Straight away. And she said, six years we haven't spoken. He said, no wonder. He said, the youth that has disobeyed his mother cannot say, La ilaha illallah in his deathbed. He said to her, now please, all I ask you is just forgive him just for my sake. And then hopefully he will be alright. As soon as she forgives him, he goes back to me and says, Say La ilaha illallah, the words La ilaha illallah come out of the mouth straight away. So here on one angle, it is vital for us to reply with the role of the mother. But what is the second angle? The second angle is how Rasulullah raised the status of the female. Not like no other human being has ever done in history, the status of woman was raised in the most ignorant area. Why? Because if you read Surah Al-Jum'ah, Surah 62, verse 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ 
Rasulullah's role was not only to tell the people the signs of God, but his second role was Tazkiyah, purification of Arabia. Arabia was fi what? Fi dalalim mubin. They were openly in ignorance. The female in Arabia was treated as a commodity, a sexual commodity. But if you were to read histo- history, history will tell you Arabia around the period of Muhammad was the most modern era. Go to Cambridge history annals. They will tell you hist- history shows that in the period of Muhammad, Arabia was at the height of modernity. That it was the center of commercial trade. Because in, to them, that was what modernity was. Michael Hart in his book, The 100 Most Influential Men, puts as number three, Jesus. Number two, Newton. Number one, Muhammad. Why? He says because Newton achieved success on the secular but not the religious. Jesus achieved success on the religious but not the secular. Muhammad achieved success both on the religious and on the secular level. And what you find, Arabia used to treat women in the most oppressive of ways. The first way which one has to look at was the way where women, the marriage ceremonies in Arabia. You have the normal marriage ceremony, which we're all used to, that is the normal one. You have the second marriage ceremony, which was called an istifza. This, what happened in this one? When a father wanted, his, wanted a son from a very good line, he would tell his wife, do you mind sleeping with that guy? Sleep with him, please, so we can have a son from their family. She would sleep with him, she would stay with him for nine months, and then after that, when the child would be born, he'd look after it. That was the second way of marriage. The third way was what is known today, excuse my language, is prostitution, that there would be a lady who would have a red flag outside her house. This red flag would mean, I think it's swapped for the red light these days, this, um, these days what happens is, and you will see the red light in those days, what's the red flag? The person would come in, now listen to this, when the person would come in, everyone would have their intercourse, and she would have ten in one day, everyone would have their intercourse, when the child is born, a person who is a specialist would come and look at the face of the child and say, yes, it belongs to that one over there. This was modernity. Arabia was the most modern land in history. Go to Cambridge and Oxford, you will find it's the most modern, modern era was Arabia. But this was what was going on in Arabia. And fourthly, the female was buried alive. When a female would be born, if an Arabian did not think she was going to be of value to him economically, what they would do is they would bury the female alive after three days. That is, you know the story, you know Ammar bin Yasser, the famous companion of Rasulullah. In the hadith, Ammar bin Yasser, how does how did his parents actually come to the religion of Islam? One of the stories is, and you would have seen this in the film, The Message, his, he comes home, when he comes home there is an idol. He accidentally, his shoulder hits the idol, the idol falls on the ground. His parents, Sumaya and Yasser, look at him and they say, Ammar, how dare you do this? God has just fallen on the ground and been broken. And he looked at his parents and he said, My parents, how could this be God when he cannot even look after himself? And then they looked at him and they said to him, Ammar, who taught you to reply to us in this way? And the reply came, Rasulullah has taught me. And they said to him, What else has this Muhammad taught you? And he said, Muhammad has taught me that the female is of the highest position in society and that the female is not a commodity. And then the female should not be buried alive. So when he, his mother at this moment begins to cry, he asks her, why do you cry? Yasser, her husband, explains to Ammar, he says, when your aunties, Sumayya's older sisters, when they were born, Sumayya's father would bury them alive. When the second one was being buried alive, she put her hand out towards her father as he was buried. He said, I will never bury, if I have another daughter, I will never bury her alive again. So Sumayya was crying because she said, Ammar, what Muhammad is teaching is exactly what us women have been calling out for in Arabia all these years. If this is what Muhammad is teaching, let me and your father join the religion of Muhammad. So here you find what? The emancipation of the female from the slavery. Then after this, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us important verses about the most modern woman but the most modest woman. The Quran gives you examples that a woman, a female, can be in the most modern, aristocratic, affluent position, but she can only find happiness when she finds modesty. Number one, the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba is mentioned in the Quran, her name is Balqis. She, what happened is, Nabi Sulaiman used to have the hoopoe bird. The hoopoe bird, the husband, 
It would go away and it would go on its travels. It would go on its travels, and then one day the hoopo bird was late. So Nabi Sulaiman says to the hoopo bird, why have you been late? The hoopo bird, as you know, Nabi Sulaiman could, uh, Prophet Solomon could communicate with the animals and so on. The hoopo bird replied by saying, all prophets of God, there is a female whose kingdom is just as great as yours. You have one side of the hemisphere, she has the second side of the hemisphere. He says, who is this lady? The reply is, she's called the Queen of Sheba. Which religion does she follow? She doesn't believe in any God. They do not follow any religion. He says, okay, here's a letter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Please come towards the path of God. Who bird, take it towards this queen. Let us see how she is like. When they take it to the queen of Sheba, she looks at the letter. She says, this sounds like a very honorable man, that he's being very pleasant in his ways. She says, but let me test whether he truly is someone who is a prophet, as he claims. What she does, she sends presents to see whether a prophet of God will be influenced by uh, presence and forget the whole meaning of religion. When the presents are sent, Nabi Sulaiman becomes angry because he is unhappy that someone has tried to con him through presence. At this moment, he wants the Queen of Sheba's throne right near his palace. So she would come over there. As soon as the Queen of Sheba's throne comes near the palace, the Queen of Sheba, in all her pomp and all her majesty, emerges and looks at his palace. She sees it as a great palace and she comes in when she comes in, she was wearing a dress. This dress that she is wearing, she begins to lift her dress. Why? Because in front of her, in the palace, there seemed like there was a, there was a water. There was like a swimming pool right in front of her. Something, a very nicely designed pool. So what she does, she lifts her dress, so her dress does not become wet. At this moment, she realizes that that is not actually water. It is water, but with the most finite glass on top of it. And at this moment, she says, if the palace of a servant of God can be so great that it deceives the queen of Sheba into thinking that this is water and not glass, then how great must his God be? And at this moment, she leaves the world. She is in the world of modernity. She finds happiness in the world of modesty. Modernity and modesty coming together. Number one. Number two, you find a story in the Quran of Zulaikha. Zulaikha is in the story of whom? Nabi Yusuf. Zulaikha is the one who tried to send Nabi Yusuf and what I find is the best part of any Qur'an that see that moment where you have to analyze Nabi Yusuf running away from a female when locked in a room. Okay? Here, Zulaikha is the one who is trying to tempt him. Of course, Nabi Yusuf is taken to prison. When he is taken to prison, Zulaikha is all set free. But then later on, Zulaikha admits she tried to deceive Yusuf. What was Zulaikha's position in Egypt at the time? She was the wife of the treasurer of the king of Egypt. What else? Which other modern life do you want? The wife of the treasurer of the king of Egypt. But when Zulaikha, she leaves all that life, she eventually comes towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When she comes towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Zulaikha marries Nabi Yusuf. When she marries Nabi Yusuf, or every day Nabi Yusuf would narrate, every day, when I would come back home, Zulaikha would be in sujood. I would come to Zulaikha, I'm thinking Zulaikha. When I was a young guy, you used to run after me, Okay, you locked the doors on me. Now when I have married you, because Allah gave her her youth back, now that I married you, all you are doing is staying in sujood. What's going on? And at this moment she replied, when I was, when you, when I ran after you in that room, there was you alone and no God. But now when I'm married to you, there is you and there is God, and there is only one winner, and that is God. So you find here how Zulaikha leaves this world of modernity, the great world, but mixes it together with the world of modesty. And the third example which the Qur'an gives, which is the most famous example, is Asiya. Asiya was the wife of who? Pharaoh. Now whose wife do you want to be other than Pharaoh when it comes to the world of the modern lifestyle? What do you have? Do you know Asiya? Pharaoh would never allow Asiya to walk. Never. If Asiya was seen walking, Pharaoh would kill the person who's making her walk. Asiya, he loved her so much that when she used to get up, he would make sure there is a carriage ready just to move around anywhere she wants to go. He could not take seeing Asiya hurting herself. And you know the story, Nabi Musa, the famous story. Who is the one who saves Nabi Musa apart from the Lord? Who is the one who saves Nabi Musa from being? She is the one. She is the one who takes him from the river. And look how Pharaoh loved Asiya. Pharaoh would kill any other male. But only because Asiya called him called Musa the apple of her eye, Pharaoh did not kill Musa. Look at the love. But when Asiya sees the magicians performing their magic, 
And when she sees Musa's magic overriding their magic, at this moment, what does she say? She says, now I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. Pharaoh, with all his love for her, asks her the question, you are living the richest lifestyle in the most aristocratic society, and you want to go towards Musa and his people? She said, Pharaoh, I find that modernity, the modern life is one thing, but the modest life is even greater. And she leaves it, and do you know how he executes her? They uh, stretch her body, two hands, and the two feet are stretched apart by two pillars, and the pillars move away until her body is completely stretched and killed. Modesty, yes, modesty can be mixed with modernity. There is no problem whatsoever. You can live in the most modern lifestyle, but happiness is in the modest lifestyle when they are combined together. And that is why when you find the greatest woman in the religion of Islam, she combines modernity and modesty all in one character, and that is Fatima al-Zahra. Salawatullahu salamu alayha. Fatima al-Zahra, when you look at Allah, Fatima al-Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, there is one concept you must understand about her. Many people, when they hear the story of Fatima al-Zahra, straight away they imagine, yeah, I'm sure she's from a poor family, you know, not the most well-off family, surely not the most modern family. What they do not realize is that Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, is in the heart of Quraysh. Quraysh is all underneath her feet. From one side, her father is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib. Imagine this royal family tree. You know how you have Charles, the son of Elizabeth, the son, you know, the Windsor's pride themselves on their family tree. Her family tree, from both sides, is the most prestigious family tree in Arabia. So she is really the daughter of royalty in Arabia. But Fatima al-Zahra finds her happiness living the modern lifestyle, but the most modern lifestyle and the most modest lifestyle. This is what she combines in one. That what we take from Fatima al-Zahra is what Rasulullah leaves behind for us. When you want to bring up a female in the religion of Islam, Rasulullah says there are four key areas when you bring up a female in the religion of Islam. One of them is modesty. The other three are modern aspects. He says, number one, عَلْمُهُنَّ الْفِقْوَ وَالْدِينَ Teach them fiqh and teach them religion. This is the modest aspect. That when they know their fiqh and they know their religion, when they know their jurisprudence and they know their religion, they will achieve modesty by being able to combine this religious aspect and this jurisprudential law aspect. Number one. The other three all bring in them the modern life as well. Because he goes on to say, عَلَّمُوهُنَّ الْكِتَابَ Teach them how to write. عَلَّمُوهُنَّ الْحِسَابَ Teach them mathematics, because of course the female always controls the mathematics at home. And عَلَّمُوهُنَّ الْخِيَاطَ Khiyata, what's khiyata? Stitching, yes, the knitting and so on. Because what Rasulullah is saying here is, in one aspect we are building modest women. But in the other three, we are building women who may have to earn their own livelihood as well. Al-Mu'anna al-Kitab wa al-Hitab wa al-Khiyab all makes for something against the rubbish that was taught by the Taliban, that the female cannot earn a livelihood. On the contrary, Islam and the Prophet Muhammad stressed that these are the four key areas for the female in Islam. And that is why Fatima al-Zahra not only is from the most modern of families, but in herself is the height of modesty. That Rasulullah narrates the famous story when he says, I came in with the blind man. As you all know the story, he comes in with the blind man. When he comes in with the blind man, what happens is, he says, Fatima, wear your hijab. There is a blind man who has come with me. And at this moment, Fatima says, Zahra, she keeps her hijab on. Rasulullah looks at her, the blind man is next to him. Rasulullah, of course, knows what she's going to say, but he wants the blind man to hear. At this moment, Rasulullah says, Fatima, why do you wear your hijab? He is a blind man. She replies, he cannot see me, but I can see him. Do you see where hijab is? Hijab in Islam is three areas, not one. Too many are drawn into the material hijab. In Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, inna qad nazdalna libasat, yuari sawatikum warishan wa libasat taqwa. Three hijabs are mentioned in the religion of Islam. Number one is what? Libas and yuari sawatikum. Which is the hijab, the clothing that protects your private parts. 
This is common in all cultures, apart from certain areas of the Amazon. You will find that in every, every part in the world, everyone seeks to protect their private parts, yes? Ya Bani Adam, qalladzalna libasani warisaw ajkum. Number two, warishan. And your areas of beauty. Because in hijab these days, I, honestly, I've seen some classic hijabs where I've gone around the world. I've seen, I've, I've, I, you know, I, I might just say, in Edward Road, it's bound to happen. You might see a hijab like this. I saw a hijab once. I could not believe this. And maybe, you know, I might have smoked too much shisha that night. But I could not believe that hijab. That what happened was there was a girl wearing hijab and a jumper and a mini skirt. I, you know, that one just did not work for me. But that's the most absurd style of hijab possible these days. And then that moves on to the level of tight jeans, tight jumper, but hijab, you know, on the hair. Okay? That problem here is when Allah says warishan, rishan means your areas of beauty. The female and the male are included in both of these. The female in the sense that the female has certain assets, which she knows how to show in some cases, yes? You will see on the television, for example, that the female knows what type of jeans to wear and which type of jumper will make her look best, yes? So here you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying the area of beauty, even in the male. Some males, for example, Habibi, I can tell you've got muscle. You don't have to wear a top that size, you know. I can tell from a mile away you're built. You go to the gym, the gym credit to you, well done. I can tell you've got a six pack, well done. You don't have to wear a vest that shows the whole world, you know. So here what you have is that the hijab for the female and the male, number two, warishan. So the first two are what? The material hijab. The third one is what is it? Walibat al The third one is spiritual hijab. The first two are material hijab. Modesty comes in materialism and spirituality. The third hijab is the hijab of taqwa. Hijab of taqwa means what? Hijab of God's consciousness. That when I am walking, I am honoring the message of Rasulullah. And I am an example who is reflecting Fatima al-Zahra and reflecting Zainab. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say, Zinat al-Bawatun ajman min Zinat al-Bawatun. The beauty of the inside is much greater than the beauty of the outside. The idea was what? That when a female shows modesty and shows akhlaq, this is greater than any beauty that she can have. You can have the most beautiful girl, the most stunning looking girl, six foot in all and everything, yes? But if she does not have modesty, you cannot bear to look at her. And I'm sure some of us in our lives may have come across a few girls like that. Yes, that maybe they, you know, quite stunning looking girls. But if the modesty is not there, it means nothing. Because the beauty is of the taqwa as well. That is why you notice the whole concept in Islam of lowering the gaze. Now you have many of these mixed gatherings in society, yes? The mixed gathering, you know, the, the weddings. The weddings have suddenly become all mixed gathering. But Ammar, we're wearing hijab. Which hijab? We're wearing the hijab, you know, we're wearing proper hijab, but all of us can see each other, can't we? In the Arab community, for example, I wouldn't be surprised if within five years you were to find that mixed gatherings and weddings continue to emerge. Because music seems to be nothing now, so why would mixed gathering be something? So what you have here in this example is that the whole concept of modesty in the female can be combined with modernity. And the daughter of Fatima in Damascus shows this best. Because when Imam Zayn al-Abideen, the son of Imam Hussein, was asked, what was the worst moment in what happened in Karbala? He said, not Karbala. Asham, Asham, Asham. What happened in Damascus was the worst moment for us. Why? Because it was there that they ripped off the hijab, the scarf of the daughter of Fatima al Zahra. The daughters of Fatima al Zahra. But look at Zainab. Zainab is the daughter of aristocracy. Zainab is the daughter of modernity. But Zainab, her main asset is her modesty. In the court of Yazid, a female representing Islam shows modernity and modesty by giving one of the most famous speeches in history. Look what she says. Oh Yazid, do you believe that now in the eyes of God you have become honorable and we have become contemptible? Now that in your belief you have been severe towards us, that you have blocked the earth's zones and the heaven's horizons. Now that in your belief you have taken us as captives. Do you believe that your reputation before God has led you to victory? You crow with pleasure because the affairs, of, uh, the affairs are in your hands. The world has turned for you and our government is with you. She says, oh Yazid, is it just that the wives, your wives and the wives of your sons are wearing their hijab, but the wives and the daughters of Rasulullah do not have their hijab? Oh Yazid, is it just 
that in your court, the noble and the ignoble, uh, the stranger and the acquaintance is able to see the daughters of the Prophet of Allah without their hijab? Oh Yazid, I do not find it as something rare, because you have always been an adversary towards us. You find your mortal sin as being nothing, and you find yourself your sinner, you don't even consider yourself as a sinner. O oh, Yazid, you strike the lips of Aba Abdullah, and you strike the teeth of Aba Abdullah. You have made the wounds of Aba Abdullah become even greater on a day like this. O oh, Yazid, the only reason I talk to you is because the plight has brought me here. Otherwise, I do not like you, but I find your scolding as being something great that you have left the holy bodies on the land of Karbala with no one to look after them but the wildebeests and the wolves. A female in Islam, because of her modesty, does not mean she could not come out and speak. On the contrary, the daughter of Fatima al Zahra stands and speaks and tells the whole world about the concept of injustice and tells the whole world about the concept of justice rising against injustice. And this concept, when we take it on today, what we realize is that modernity can be mixed with modesty. And that the religion of Islam has shown us on numerous occasions that even the Queen of Sheba, that even Zuleika, that Khadija and all her modernity found that modesty brought her success. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the path of Muhammad and Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize that if someone is not a brother of ours in faith, he is an equal of ours in humanity. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide us with the shafa'a of Aba Abdullah Hussain yeah. on the day when it counts most. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I feel a bit embarrassed to talk after brother, because, uh, mashallah, his speech was so good and she was so quiet, unlike me. And this is my first speech, and um, what well, is my first speech period? Um, especially within the Muslim society, because uh, I conducted it from nearly two years ago. Um, when I was asked to talk today about my personal experience on wearing hijab, um, I couldn't figure out how can I separate my experience of wearing hijab with, uh, from the experience of actually becoming a Muslim. And I decided since I cannot do that, um, I will force you to listen to my story, call my story, and um, inshallah you will take something from that. So I'll give you some background um, about myself. Um, I was born 22 years ago in Russia. Um, and um, when I was 17, I went, uh, I joined university to study journalism. And when I finished the third year, I knew two things about Islam. First, they're not allowed to drink, but they can smoke. And second, they're the someone's land is Muslim. Um, well, that was it. And just for your information, the, population, the Muslim population of Russia, native Muslim population, is about 20% of the total population. So that's, we see how Dawa is going on in Russia, inshallah. Um, after the third year, I decided to come here. And when I entered this multicultural country, that was the first time when I was introduced to Islam. That was basically the first time when I saw the Jadi woman in my life. What was my impression about her? The same impression as when I saw Indian woman in a dress in a sari. It's her culture. She was born this way, so that therefore she wears um, sari. And so she's Arab, she's Pakistani, she's whatever. So therefore she wears hijab. She has to. Um, that was it. I didn't link actually Islam and um, the Muslim dress and. Um, Job. It was just, just part of culture, as I said. Um, later on, when I started having some friends with Muslim, I found out very unpleasant things that um, I figured out that the difference between Christianity and Islam is that Christians wouldn't go and say that this is haram and this is haram, therefore uh, we shouldn't do that. They just do and that's it. The Muslim people, they would go, they would say that it's a haram, and then when they turn to the corner, they would do exactly the same thing. So that's what I call hypocrisy, and then um, that was the second definition for me of Islam. So that was my first experience of uh, facing Islam, unfortunately. Um, the next stage of me knowing Islam was when I first asked by one girl 
to help her to translate for her in the mosque. Because she was Chechen Muslim, so she spoke Russian, and um, she wasn't very good in English. So she asked me to accompany her in the mosque. That was Ramadan time. And we came by Iftar time. So she entered first, she was wearing a hijab and a uh, jibab. And the woman who opened the door, she asked, are you Muslim? And she said, yeah, alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim. And the woman said, well, you're welcome. And then she looked at me and said, are you Muslim? I was wearing a shirt and jeans and like, and I thought, is she trying to make fun of me or something? And I said, well, no, I'm not Muslim. She said, yeah, you're welcome. Please come in. And I got suspicious. I thought, well, okay, they tried to be nice to me in order to, um, to force me to come to a bar, and then they would start asking me questions about my religion, and then they would uh, offer me to become Muslim. And surprisingly enough, they've been so kind to me and so open to me, and they've been talking about everything but Islam or any other religion. They didn't ask me about my background, they didn't ask me what did I believe in. And uh, seeing them, at that moment I thought, it's very nice to have something which unites people. It's very nice to... It can be different factors. It can be membership, it can be blood relationship. It can be belonging to some nations, but if this uniting factor is something as strong, as powerful, and as bright as faith, it overcomes all other factors. And at that moment I thought that I envy them somehow, because they don't feel lonely. But the only problem is to believe in that. So that moment I saw um, a lot of hijabi women around me, and I actually um, felt very nice about them. And I thought the problem that, because I cannot believe in that, because the Arabs, or Pakistani, or whatever, or Asian, therefore they are from third world countries. That's why they believe in God, because I'm European, I'm smart, I'm well educated, I can't believe in God, um, because Europe already passed this stage. And when Europe was under influence of religion, it has all this kind of problems, and I don't, um, as soon as they get rid of it, it started developing and flourishing. So, inshallah, well, I didn't say inshallah, I said, um, hopefully, um, all these developing countries will overcome this stage as well, and they become um, prosperous and developed. And by this time, there would be nothing left of Islam, of course, because this is the price that you pay for progress. So I saw them, I envied them, and I knew definitely that I won't be able to become like them because since they had brains, therefore I couldn't believe in Allah. So at that stage, I left Islam with a better impression, um, with uh, appreciating Muslim a little bit more, and with a kind of interest um, inside me. And that was until the time I met one family. The girl was Russian. Um, she was a convert, and after she converted to Islam, she married a uh, Muslim guy. And uh, they completed their study in medicine in Russia, and they came here to do their PhD. And that was weird for me, because if you study philosophy or, let's say, um, music, okay, art people are a bit weird. They're a bit crazy in their own way. So, okay, they can believe in that. But they actually studied science, and yet, something or someone makes them stand up five times a day in front of the wall and make all this funny movement which they call prayer in Arabic. Um, at this point I started seriously think what's going on around, what's going on in the world. And I started asking questions. And the logic of answers left me powerless. I couldn't find any arguments to object. I couldn't find any arguments to object why women should be modest. Why there shouldn't be any relationship um, beside marriage? What is going on with Muslim world? Uh, why do we have to pray? All this kind of question, I think, we, we're not only converts asking, but sometimes even native-born Muslims asking. Um, so I got all these answers. I was convinced, but I couldn't believe. First of all, because I couldn't believe in God, and second of all, I didn't want to become a Muslim. Because still, the stereotype was in my heart, Muslim is somebody Arab or Asian or whatever, developing uh, backwards and I don't know, like that. Uh, I believe, but uh, I'm Russian and I'm an atheist and that's, that's fine. That was my logic. And, and that's how I carried on again. And then I started noticing very funny things in my behavior. 
For example, I found out that I started um, avoiding male fans, to meet male fans. And if I see them uh, far away, um, I would rather cross the road or change the di direction. Because I didn't want to shake their hands, and I didn't, want, uh, I didn't know what to say. Because if you're Muslim, and in this society, in British society, when somebody gives your hand to shake, and you say that I cannot do that because I'm a Muslim, I'm according to my religion, I'm not supposed to die of opposite sex. Well, you might have some problems sometimes, but usually it goes more like smoothly. But if you're white European, without any signs of religion, and you say, well, sorry, I can't shake your hand because I don't think it's right, people would say, well, are you okay? Or maybe something wrong with you? Or they wouldn't accept it. Another thing about alcohol. Um, before I accepted Islam, about a year, um, I didn't drink alcohol for the simple reason. I found out that there is nothing attractive or anything to like about alcohol. I didn't like its taste, I didn't like its price, I didn't like its effect, I didn't like um, its consequence. The problem was to, uh, to tell people, to tell your friends about the reason. Um, if you say that I'm Muslim, that's it. You're free from, from all the problems. Okay, you don't drink because you're Muslim. But if you say, well, I don't like the taste, they say, what do you mean? Nobody likes the taste. The thing is that psychologically they're so attached to it that they don't need um, any excuses to drink it anymore. Recently I visited my home and I visited one of my relatives. And um, while I was there, the friend of her called her and she said, I feel a bit down and um, a bit uh, bored. So my relative invited her and said, okay, let's come and have a chat. No, you know, I don't feel like drinking. I said, what are you talking about? I, I invited you for a chat. I didn't say you like drink or anything. I said, are we going to chat like that without drinking? So this concept of having fun or having a nice time or relaxing or going out without having alcohol um, is not rational anymore. Um, as well, I found out that I started noticing that my dress, my style of dressing, um, had changed. I started wearing a long dress. Uh, the only dress I had in my wardrobe, um, I didn't take it out anymore. And so I decided to figure out what's going on with me because if I didn't believe in God, so why do I believe in His law? Why do I believe in His word? And if I don't believe in His word, so why do I follow it? Um, I found that this does not correspond and it, it drove me crazy for a while. Until I went for my new job, which was an Italian restaurant. And before going there, I saw that in this kind of job you have all these kind of problems. So in order to avoid them, I decided to put bandana, like um, this kind of scarf, which you wear and your neck is exposed, but you had a scarf. And I thought if anybody asked me, I would say I'm Muslim, and therefore I would escape all these problems. It's a funny thing, because I wanted to enjoy the respect which is paid to Muslim women, but I didn't want to share their hardship of being Muslim. So I went at work and I put on a bandana and I uh, went to meet his staff. And there was this guy, I was a chef, and he was all there. He looked at me and said, are you Muslim? And I said, yes, I am. And I thought, am I? Is it like I'm just a Berea and I'm Muslim indeed? And when I came out from work, I realized that I don't want to take it off. Because this kind of protection it gave me um, not only you can see that, but you can feel it. I felt that um, there is somebody to take care of me, for sure, because I can feel it. I'm protected, and I don't want to lose it. I went to my friend, Muslim friend, and asked her, can you teach me how to pray? And she said, do you want to be Muslim? And I said, I suppose I am. And she said, okay, but before you answer anything serious, I want to warn you. It's very difficult to be Muslim. You have to wear a certain kind of clothes. Um, you should give up your old habits. Um, you shouldn't have male friends. And there are lots and lots of things, so you should think carefully. And I said, that's not difficult. What is difficult is not to have any criteria according to which you can judge what is wrong and what is right. What is difficult is to hear that one, you, one of your friends say that this is right. Your mom says something different, and then the Nietzsche book you're reading says completely opposite, and then your heart feels that, 
all that is rubbish and wrong. And you're in a constant conflict day by day. You wake up with a, uh, one criteria and you go to bed with another one. And you're in constant um, seeking for the truth. And it's very tiring. So I was ready to wear whatever I'm told to wear. I was ready to pray as many times as I'm told to do. As long as I know that the source from which all these orders are coming is the total and ultimate truth. And I was prepared for that. So actually, my experience in hijab was um, primer to my experience of taking shahada. And uh, after I took shahada, of course, I was already wearing a scarf, so not a proper one. Uh, but at least. And after that, straight away, I realized the second benefit of hijab when I entered the shop. And the shopkeeper just looked very quick at me and said, Well, you can. And that was the first time when I was recognized as a Muslim, when I was accepted uh, formally, officially, to the Muslim society. I was one of them, I was one of the club. And uh, there was such a happiness, which I didn't even feel when I think I took Shahada. Um, they didn't ask me about my documents, they didn't ask me uh, where I was born, or whether I was born Muslim, who are my parents. Uh, it was sufficient for them just my look, just this cup, and they didn't say Salaam Alaikum. And, and so that, that was the best gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was given to people, and um, which gives you this sense of unity. Um, then, it was, um, it took me for a while to wear proper hijab, because I don't know why, but for some reason, you look at these women who are wearing proper hijab and you think, inshallah, inshallah, one day I will be like that. And you think, but what stops you from being like that? What prevents you? And then you start looking for all kinds of excuses. Because this is a step which, if you take it, you can't come back. Because before that, you can't find an excuse. But once you've done it, and then you take it off, there is, uh, it's obvious that you were too weak. There is no other excuses. Um, you didn't pass this test. So you want to postpone it and put it off as much as possible, as long as possible. So I decided to find my own excuse, why am I not wearing a proper hijab? And I thought, well, because I'm working. I don't have anybody to support me, my parents do not help me, and in a hijab, of course, how can I work in a, in a full hijab? And I thought, fine, if you cannot work in a full hijab, work in a half hijab, sort of, and then outside you wear a full hijab. What's wrong with that? I said, okay, fine, but, um, and that's all. I was run out of excuses. And um, I was kind of forced um, to wear the job because I couldn't find anything else for myself. Um, I started wearing it and it was, it was very weird to see uh, my own reflection in the window shop. Uh, it scared me sometimes because I didn't feel that that's me, that that girl. Sometimes it felt as if it's a dream and uh, that's not real, what's going on with me and like one day I will wake up and everything will go back to normal. And finally slowly I think I got used to this idea. And the one very important point also which I wanted to make is for sisters who already wear the job. Um, I wanted to remind you because of course all of you know that this hijab is not only a piece of cloth and not only barrier from all the things which are coming outside, as brother um, before we mentioned it. Um, I remember one girl, she's Catholic, and um, we tried to talk about the religion and she came over a couple of times asking about Islam. And um, I was sitting in front of Miro to wear my hijab in order to go out and show her way to the metro, and she looked at me and she said, you know, I envy you so much because of this piece of cloth. I really want sometimes to cover myself from all these looks, but I can't because I'm not Muslim and I don't want to be Muslim, yeah? I'm Christian and I believe in my, uh, in my faith. And if I'm wearing a scarf, people are going to recognize me as a Muslim because unfortunately Christians are not wearing a scarf anymore, but I do want to wear it. And I said, subhanAllah, this girl has something which a lot of Muslim girls, unfortunately, do not have this kind of shame in her heart. So the hijab is not only, um, well, it's primary object, it's to cover you, but also it's a label. Once you wear it, you scream to the, to the world that you are Muslim. Um, 
the Beato brothers, um, sometimes they give a kind of, kind of fashion, sometimes they just, um, some people just forgot to shave or something. It's not a particular belong to Muslim. But if you see the sister in a proper hijab, you'll never think that, well, she's just a fashionable Christian, or she's just Hindu because they also cover their head sometimes. No, you will know that she's Muslim, and you'll know that she believes very firmly in her creed, and she's doing what she has to do. And since you put the hijab on, you stop being a neighbor, a roommate, a colleague, you started being a Muslim. And since that moment, your behavior, your speech, your deeds, are con considered um, for, by environment as a Muslim behavior, as a Muslim speech, as a Muslim manner. When I came home, I had trouble to explain to my mother what Islam is. Because she said, please don't talk to me about what Islam and how Muslim are, because I've been in Emirates. I know how Arabs are. I know that in one corner they have prayer mat, and in another corner they have a bar. The mom, you can't generalize Muslim. They're not proper Muslim. This is not Islam. She said, fine. I've been in Turkey, and I had to cut her off because I said, Turkey is not even a Muslim country anymore. It's not considered a Muslim country, and uh, Turkish are not the best example of Muslims. She said, okay. In Russia, we have so many nationalities which are um, natively born Muslim, like Chechen, Tata, and they all work with me. And they all perfectly fine with drinking alcohol, with eating pork. They don't have any ideas about what each other is. I said, Mom, they're not proper Muslim either. I said, okay, show me proper Muslim. Who are they, this mysterious proper Muslim, which I can't even see? You? Don't you think it's a bit funny when you're talking about Islam, about Muslim, and you're the one the example who I can see amongst all these native-born Muslims? My daughter, my own daughter, who I brought up in a Christian country, you were, for me, proper example of Islam. And that's why, um, from the name of all conference, uh, I'm asking, well, it's not only to sisters, I suppose, but just, uh, it's, it's more heavy on sisters' shoulders, because this is a clear sign for everybody that you're Muslim. Watch carefully what are we doing and how we're doing things. And uh, let's not shame our Prophet Allah Asali because I think he already had much shame uh, from his Ummah. And thank you very much for your attention and please forgive me for all the mistakes and for my uh, nervous speech. And I hope that even if you take 1% of the speech, it seems it's, it's very good. Alhamdulillah. Firstly, I'd like to say I think we're extremely privileged to have someone like your sister a diary here. It's, it's really rare to have such a touching and amazing story which I think is applicable to all of us, not just the sisters but also to the brothers. And uh, I thank her again for coming and inshallah she'll continue to give uh, such touching moving uh, talks to, uh, to other Muslim and non Muslims who uh, I'm sure would benefit. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Sayyidi and Amman uh, for the question and answer session. Um, I'll be just taking questions from the floor, so whoever's got a question, put your hand up and we'll start with that.